Alrighty, folks. So today we are moving on in the everything you wanted to know about the Earth, but we're afraid to ask conversation that we started the other day. And um, it's actually dark enough in here this morning. We could probably actually do this experiment for once. Um, what this is about is. Uh, well, as the slide says, incoming solar radiation. All right, well, we're going to talk about it in terms of daylight and uh, lack thereof. And um, keep in mind that it also, has an, it also has some impact, a lot of impact, on uh, how much energy. All right, solar radiation is energy. How much energy an area of the world gets. And what we're talking about are, of course, your, your latitudes. Now, if you're like me, it took you a really long time to remember which one was latitude, which one was longitude. Uh, we're talking, of course, about moving north and south, as this graphic shows here. Uh, basically, from the equator to the center, moving upwards to the North Pole, southwards to the South Pole. Living where we are, having an education where you get, we can talk primarily about the Northern Hemisphere in all your classes, uh, unless it's some, you know, other world civ or something like that. But we usually use, you know, our reference point for this. But we'll acknowledge the Southern Hemisphere from time to time. So let's start with the fact that the Earth is tilted on its axis. You may or may not have known that. Uh, last time we looked at a globe, um, you may have noticed that it was quite conveniently tilted towards you. And uh, possibly, you spun it around, you saw, hey, that puts North America right front and center. And I always thought that was some sort of marketing thing. I always say North American or centric, right? I always showed you a few maps already, and it's always got North America right in the middle. But it doesn't really have a thing to do with that, just me being paranoid of the corporations, you know. Um, what it really is, is that we are indeed tilted 23 and a half degrees off of straight up and down. All right. And that does, as I said, conveniently give the globe a nice little, makes it easy to read and all that stuff, right? Yeah, it wasn't for us. It's just realistic. So because of that tilt, the energy from the sun actually gets fairly well dispersed um, through the majority of the globe. If it didn't, if it didn't have that tilt, it would always just sort of aim most of its energy. There's always some, you know, it's a sphere, right? You shine a light on a ball, it's going to curve a little bit. They're not both directions. But we're talking about the majority of the energy. If we didn't have that tilt, the majority of the energy would always be on the equator. Where I'm going with this is, is that we wouldn't have seasons. All right? Because they always say the reason for the season, usually they're talking about Christmas. But in this case, it's 23 and a half degrees. That's what this flashlight is attempting to show you here. Um, feel free to do this. Uh, you can attempt to do it with your cell phones now. Um, the sunlight is coming in a little more in the last couple minutes. But um, the idea is uh, an experiment you could do at home with a flashlight, a pencil, a piece of paper, and ideally a friend, because most of you don't have a third arm. Um, you hold a flashlight straight over, perpendicular, as they say in math class, perpendicular over your uh, piece of paper, and <clears throat> it's going to leave a circle of brightness, right? Um, the idea is you draw a, a pencil circle around that circle of light to remember its diameter better. Well, then you tilt your flashlight. And guess what? Spoiler alert. That circle turns into an oval, right? Now you're going to trace that oval with your pencil. And then you're going to go back and actually pay attention to the brightness. And you guys tell me, let's give a predicted outcome here. Um, when is the light going to be brighter? When it's in that first circular area 
or when it's in the second, uh, more oval area? Where's the light going to be the brightest? Yeah. In the second oval, how come? Because it's spreading more. So the light will be brighter because it's spreading more. Okay. So the first one would be brighter. All right. Because it's more concentrated. All right. What do you guys think? The rest of you. More concentrated. Now, what you said, I think maybe you were going for, it's going to show up more over more of a, a bigger area. Yeah. All right, but that, which is true, but what we're concerned primarily about is the, the brightness, the energy. Remember, this is about the incoming light, and if you can make the flashlight brighter over a bigger area, like have an extra, you know, a power booster switch on it or something, you could probably light up that oval as well as you did the circle. But it's going to be brighter in the circle because the energy is more concentrated. And what that is supposed to be is a, uh, we'll, we'll just call it an analogy, um, for the sun coming in to the earth, all right? And talking about how when it is uh, hitting straight at the equator, more or less perpendicular, it's really, really concentrated. And then as you go up either side, uh, up or down of the, uh, of the earth, it starts to spread out more, it's less concentrated. And we could make, match that up, all right, very easily with our own knowledge. How many of you have been to the equator? Okay. One of these days, someone will raise their hand. Is it nice and hot and unbearably humid and none all that stuff there at the equator, or is it icy cold? Yeah, the hot one. All right, and as we go towards the poles, well, it gets less and less and less so to the extreme of hitting the North Pole or the South Pole when it's, okay, just ice cold. Pardon the pun. Um, so we're relating that roughly to, to incoming solar radiation. Okay, you get the most incoming solar radiation year-round in that centralized area there. And then the further you go up, north or south, all right, you get less and less bang for the buck. Now, as it turns out, that region that gets the most energy, I told you, because we had that tilt, it's actually widened. It's spread out a little bit. It goes from 23 and a half north latitude down to 23 and a half south latitude. If that 23 and a half sounds familiar, it should. It's the tilt that we have. So again, because of that tilt, the most energy of the sun isn't always focused on the equator. It actually moves up 23 and a half degrees, comes back down to the equator, moves down 23 and a half degrees, and comes back up. It's a cycle. Keeps going on and on and on and on and on and on. Now, of course, we've got names for all this crap, and that's where you guys come in. You gotta remember this stuff. Alright. Really tiny print. But you've heard of these words more than likely. 23 and a half north is Tropic of Cancer. Cancer the crab, not the disease. 23 and a half south is Tropic of Capricorn. <clears throat> and again, if you're like me, you can never keep them straight. Yeah, you remember the vocabulary words, but which one is which? Eh, it's alphabetical. I figured that out about too embarrassingly recently to, to mention. <coughs> so Cancer comes first, Capricorn second. So it goes Cancer, Equator, Capricorn. Right? So, what does that have to do with anything? As I said, the seasons. We are at a, my least favorite time of the year. Some people really dig it. Snow sports enthusiasts and, I don't know, sadists. I don't know who else. Um, we've got hardly any light cold out there. It's just not my, my cup of tea, as they say. We're moving out of that, as you guys know. You may have noticed it's starting to get lighter, longer. 
not warmer yet. That'll take a while. But it's starting to get lighter longer, getting more of our days back. It's because we're moving through this cycle. And think back to this fall, going into this winter, as we started to lose light. And all of a sudden, it was dark at what? 4.30, right? Remember those glory days? I actually prefer that to this because it was a little warmer. But whatever. So you're aware of this cycle. You've been walking through this cycle for 20-odd years now. We're just going to explain it to you in this context. So you've heard of equinoxes, hopefully. You've heard of solstices, hopefully. Okay. Um, we're going to use those words today. The dates bounce a little bit. We're going to use the 21st for all of them. We're going to get a rid of one variable here, just to keep things a little easier for you. But yeah, sometimes it is the 20th of this or the 22nd of that. But for the test, we're just going to keep everything the 21st. That doesn't really mess up your life any. And I'm telling you that I'm lying to you. So, so let's uh, pick a season to start with here. It's a cycle. It's a circle. It doesn't you know, really matter where we start. But we're in winter. So let's start in winter. We'll go back a little over a month to the winter solstice. All right. December 21st. I'm sure all of you celebrated it, danced around a ring of rocks and whatnot with your family. Um, wasn't that long ago we did that, though. A lot of folks at any rate. On December 21st, this diagram is attempting to show you, because of the tilt of the Earth, the majority of the sun's energy is focused below the equator. We're going to call that 23 and a half south. As we move from the winter solstice to the vernal equinox, we don't say spring, we say vernal. To the vernal equinox, which is the beginning of spring, which is in a little under two months. I'm not counting the days or anything. The majority of the sun's energy is going to move. You can't really see it in the bottom picture because it's the back is facing to you, but if you look up top, you'll see the idea. The majority of the sun's energy is going to be moving its focus back up towards the equator. What that's doing for us in the northern hemisphere, of course, is very gradually scooching a little more sunlight and sun energy up towards where we live. Then, as we leave the vernal equinox and approach the summer solstice, the sun continues its journey, moving upwards from the equator to eventually 23 and a half north on June 21st, again, the summer solstice. And we are sort of in its glory there, right? We've got most of the sun's energy shining on us. It's wonderful. A lot of daylight, a lot of sunlight. Then it starts moving back down to the equator. By the autumnal equinox, the equinoxes have weird names, solstices don't. But you know the word autumn at least this time, it's not like vernal. That was kind of weird. Autumnal equinox, the fall equinox. The majority of the Earth's energy is focusing itself on the equator again. As we move from the autumnal equinox uh, to the winter solstice, that sun makes its journey, keeps going further and further south, bringing its focus down again to the 23 and a half latitude. And it just goes on and on and on, bouncing back and forth from 23 and a half north to 23 and a half south, stopping twice yearly at the equator. So a couple things to point out about that. You've probably heard that the seasons are reversed, right? So uh, when we are having our summer, 
all the, not all, the, a lot of the sun's energy is more focused to the northern hemisphere. That is winter in the southern hemisphere. Spin that around to the other side of the clock there, and when the sun is focused its energy uh, below the equator, well, you already know that we have winter in December, right? So that's that's what's going on. That's the why. All right, we lose some of the sun's energy. It affects our weather, so on and so forth. So that is one seasonal change right there. You can directly attribute to the sun moving north and south some of the winter. If you haven't already picked up on it, like I said, a few things just to point out here randomly, you've heard of the tropics, right? Now you may not have thought they were as big as uh, the, these, uh, it's probably slightly enlarged to, eh, it really doesn't look like it's out of scale. If you got 66 up there, 23 would be there. Um, a lot wider than most of you may have thought. But again, if you look at North America in context to that, even Florida, which is rather balmy by most people's standards, is way above 23 and a half north. Okay? So even Florida isn't at it. The equator, well, most of you more or less knew where that was. All right? And again, 23 and a half south. It's continental speaking, it's fairly, fairly south. So that tropic zone, which again you come to associate with certain weather patterns and vegetation, that's exactly what's going on there. Uh, if this were in my environmental science class, we'd be relating this directly to, um, and we can in my earth science class at least, but um, directly to the vegetation, the, the precipitation, all that stuff is linked to the sun's energy. So, it's all right there. So, what do you got to pull out of this? You got to pull out of this uh, a handful of names. 23 and a half north, 23 and a half south, tropical cancer, tropical Capricorn. All right. The equator at zero, if you didn't already know that one. You need to know where the sun's energy is focus focusing itself for the solstices. Because you all know where the sun's energy is focusing on the equinoxes. Where's that? Well, you'll never miss this one again. Equinox. E -ec yeah, clear. All right. Same first three letters. Yeah, first three letters. And I want you to know the months. Again, roughly equates to our seasons. That, of course, has to have latitudinal adjustment. How many seasons are there? At least according to this, four, good. How many months are there? Well, what's 12 divided by four? Yeah. That's three months per season, Utica. Only get three months of winter. Well, again, it varies, okay? It varies. So, questions? It's a lot of stuff. You'll want to listen to the first half of the lecture when you get a chance. I'll put it on our class site. I do. Unless you know others, you might. A little bit, you know, some of that. <laughs> so, uh, it's all about the incoming sun, solar radiation, <coughs> the reasons for the seasons. Again, questions. I told you exactly what you need to know. There's a big chunk of questions on the test about this. Now, again, it's, you know, 50 some point uh, questions, 50 some questions on the test. Um, but to have, you know, six or eight of them off of one slide, that, that's what I mean, that's a big chunk. So, um, I told you exactly what you need to know. Do uh, remember it. Because you don't want to miss all those just because you spent some extra time in this slide. So again, questions?
<coughs> Moving on. I told you I'm not a big fan of the O spheres. And I've been the uh, hydrosphere, the uh, aquasphere, the atmosphere. Well, we did talk about the atmosphere, but it's about the only sphere I like. Um, we do need to remind you more so of a couple of vocabulary words here. Uh, terrestrial and aquatic, all right? And, and you know them, but just a reminder, all right? Terrestrial, terra, terra firma is land. Even the word extraterrestrial comes from here, okay? Extra is beyond or with, without, uh, not without, but um, not from, okay? Beyond, beyond is a better word, all right? So that's where, you know, extraterrestrial, not from, not from the earth. Um, we've got 30% of that, and we covered this actually the first moment of this lecture. We talked about uh, how the oceans covered nearly three quarters of the Earth's surface. Here's a much better percentage. I did say nearly. So aquatic or aquatic, as I like to say, this is the water environment. And in this context, we're strictly referring to the oceans, but you know there's water on land as well. There's water in the atmosphere as well. So that's spread itself all over the place, but... All right. And as I said, we're just kind of throwing out... Um, all kinds of factoid data in this in this discussion. So we're we're jumping around a bit, and this is why I said it's not exactly tied to one um, chapter in your book. Unfortunately, you could certainly find all this information at uh, your friend the index. All right, if you were to Google, eh, Google, it's old fashioned Google and looking in the index. If you were to go through the index uh, and look through these terms, you'd find them all in chapters, but you wouldn't want me to list. You know, all of those chapters for you. And that's why God created an index anyhow. So, uh, next, we want to talk about the going into the earth a little bit. We'll do this a good bit more uh, in depth in a moment or two. But just a simple factoid right now. Approximately, again, that tilde sign means approximately 4,000 miles to the center of the earth. Well, why is it approximately? Don't we know? Well, we haven't been there yet, right? Uh, unless you believe Jules Verne, and even then, I don't think he went all the way to the center. Um, but uh, he went into the earth, right? If, if we did that. Who's Jules Verne? Who's Jules Verne? You've never heard of Jules Verne? Uh, you'll, you'll Google that one a little later. Or feel free to look out your phone now. He was a very old science fiction writer. He lived right near the center of the earth. Oh. You know that story. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we got 4,000 miles. Why is it approximately? Well, we got mountains, we got valleys, we got sea level. All right. Uh, I could give you, it ranges from this top of the highest mountain to this the bottom of the lowest valley. Yeah. Approximately 4,000 miles. It's geology. We round. All right. So out of that 4,000 miles, this, all these intrepid explorers, how far have we gone? Two miles. Remember I told you, we're fairly limited in what we can do. And if you've ever been flipping through the channels back when people had cable, and uh, you come across something on Discovery Channel or National Geographic or whatever, and you see they're doing a show on diamonds or something like that, and you see these people coming up from the mines, and they're just, you know, all of 75 pounds and soaked in sweat and wearing nothing but a loincloth. There's a reason for that. It's miserable down there. Absolutely miserable down there, despite the working conditions and the slave labor and all that. I don't even mean that. I just mean the actual physical conditions, the pressure, the heat. So I told you the other day, we can't go up very well at all without any special equipment. You can't go down either. All right. Now, we've drilled, don't get me wrong, we've drilled way deeper, but that's a drill bit. We don't really care about drill bits. Well, some of the really expensive ones they probably care about a little bit. And this number's probably even changed. This is an old slide. We've drilled probably a little deeper. But people in mining 
that hasn't really varied enough for me to that I'm aware of for me to change that number. So there's not just that reason for telling you this, but also going back to when we talked about the scientific method, okay, and a lot of the different ways that we have to do stuff. I'm going to be telling you about the layers of the earth and, and what this is made out of and what that's made out of and, and how plate tectonics works. And, and you're like, oh, but these people haven't been more than, you know, like from MV to the McDonald's inside the earth. And they're, yep, yeah, you're absolutely right. But, but when you know how to work with indirect evidence, when you know how to get data without actually going somewhere, remote, okay, sensing of things, um, you can find out a decent amount about places that you can't go to. This is true when we're talking about studying the stars and the planets, and it's just as true when we're talking about going into the Earth. All right, And when we can't even get farther than two miles into the Earth, it should be no surprise then that we have so much trouble, you know, going out to other planets and stuff like that. This is one place where we've got a long way to catch up to sci-fi. A long way. So just a couple comparisons. All right. <clears throat> I should have a Manhattan to LA or something like that on here. Not that uh, half of you have made the trip or anything. I haven't made the trip. But um, just to give you some comparison for that bigger number, that 4,000 miles there. Um, but uh, if you've driven, and I just actually did the Utica Manhattan and then some last weekend, um, you've gone, you know, way farther than we've gotten uh, into, the, into the earth. And Buffalo is about the same the other direction, if I'm not mistaken. Those of you that have gone that way. Some of you have come a lot longer than that, even. Okay? So we have barely, barely gotten into this. Now, you got your spacemen and stuff going up into space, and if you've been in an airplane, yeah, you've been up pretty high. Um, a few years back, you guys might have been middle school ish. Remember when there was that huge Red Bull craze and everyone was, well, crazy on Red Bull? Um, they had a guy go up uh, into the jump from the stratosphere, free fall. Um, that was pretty high, and he was basically in a spacesuit. All right, um, we're just really, really limited. Enjoy your freedom. If you have a car, if you occasionally get to go in a car, um, or even rent a bus or whatever you do, fly in an airplane. Enjoy that freedom, folks. Because unless you grow up to have a really, really special job, that's all you get. So, perfect example, the Mohorovicic discontinuity. We ain't never been there. But we know it exists. How do we know it exists? Well, Professor Mohorovicic, who took pity on us very early on and agreed that we could just refer to him as Moho, all right? I didn't make up the Moho line. I learned that 30 years ago, and I'm sure they made it up a good bit before that, even. Uh, back when he was doing his work, uh, well, we hadn't just started blowing up giant bombs, but um, we started paying attention to the fact that when we blew up these giant bombs, the whole damn Earth shook. All right, we've got these things called seismographs. Familiar with them? You may not know the name. You've definitely seen them in movies. It's that red pen that jiggles on a sheet of paper that's scrolling by, and when something happens, it starts bouncing up and down really, really high. Uh, kind of like an EKG, but of the Earth. So we started realizing that when we blew up these giant bombs, they were filled everywhere. All the seismographs everywhere recorded it. Then they realized that they all recorded it a little differently. Now, obviously, distance was a big factor. The farther you are away from something, you've heard thunder far off, you've heard thunder up close. You get the idea. So they, you know, they realized that would be an issue, but they started to find other subtleties. Reaction time, for lack of a better word. How long it took to hit an area. 
And what they came to realize, and I, I can't even begin to understand or explain it, I should say, because I'm still trying to understand it myself. It's a bunch of geophysics stuff. I do know that, that waves travel differently through different materials. You know that. If you've ever heard music underwater, you know that it doesn't sound like it sounds on land. You're in your friend's pool, your pool, whatever. You're up on deck, you're in the water, it sounds differently. Well, those sound waves travel differently through water than they do through air. All right? And if there was a solid to transfer them through, they would transfer quite differently through the solid as well. So we applied that information. And these energy waves that are given off by these giant bombs, or earthquakes even, these energy waves that are given off by these massive events travel through the Earth, and they travel differently through different materials. And what they started to do, they were able to piece together the fact that something we knew already, but give it some data, that, okay, this solid crust of an Earth does stop at some point and turn into what we've been calling the mantle. And then after the mantle, guess what? It gets solid again, and, and, and so on and so forth. And they took enough data over enough time, enough scientists. He gets the credit for it. I don't know, maybe he wrote the first paper or was the first person to say, huh, you notice. So what he found that was essentially at the same distance all across the planet, <coughs> excuse me, we blend uh, from the crust to the mantle. And that is what the Moho Rovasich discontinuity is, or the Moho line is is the boundary between the crust and the mantle. I don't want you to know how deep it is. It does vary. But I do want you to know that it exists. And it has to do with, we found it, because of these energy waves slowing down and speeding up. They vary, all right? If you couldn't guess, uh, they travel faster through solids than they do through liquids or semi-liquids, all right? Maybe that sounds counterintuitive, um, but uh, but that is what happens. So there was a point, no matter where you again where you were on the globe, there was a, a depth at which these these sound waves slowed down, these energy waves slowed down, and that's all this low velocity, high velocity stuff. Again, don't worry about the detail. We're much more bigger picture right now. Man, it's in metric, and most of you aren't fans of metric either. So, Moho line. Boundary between the crust and the mantle. Uh, don't know why this one decided to play that game. All right, there we go. We got all the level the words on now. It's hot inside the earth. That's why a lot of the rock is molten. You go into the Earth's core, they have calculated to be about 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and that energy comes from radioactive decay. You've all heard of radioactivity and to some extent have an idea of what it is. Uh, you know that some materials can give off really bad energy, and that's usually what we call radiation. All right. Well, Everything is decaying all the time. It's just that <coughs> not all of that energy hurts you or hurts the things around you. Everything decays. Anywho, that energy can be a source of heat. And as the Earth itself, all the different elements in there, remember we talked about isotopes way back on day one there, all those different elements are breaking down, that energy given off, has kept things pretty hot inside. Now, there are planets out there, again, that we feel that this is done happening. <coughs> you may hear that this planet or that planet, if you read such things, is no longer technically te tectonically active. What they're implying is that it has either cooled off all the way through or so much so that it the heat can't hurt, help or hurt things anymore. 
Another vocabulary word. And uh, this should be in bold to indicate that it is indeed a vocabulary word. Uh, geothermal gradient, right there in the center. We've measured, we've realized, we've noticed, however you want to say it, that um, there is a slow but steady increase to that 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, it's much more eloquent in metric, but I've converted it for your enjoyment. Um, one degree Fahrenheit for every 70 feet. Again, not a factoid you're going to need to regurgitate to me, but if you go through the math for that approximately 4,000 miles and one degree Fahrenheit for every 70 feet, I'd like to think you'd end up right around 9,000. There are a few exceptions to that rule. If you've ever been in a cave or your basement, you've noticed probably that it's actually cooler there. All right, Very near the surface, we maintain more or less an ambient temperature, a constant background temperature. And I, and I, I always say I'm going to look it up. Every semester I get to the slide and say, I'm going to make a mental note to check that for next semester. It's somewhere around like 58 degrees, 62 degrees, something like that. Again, please don't quote me on that one. But there is a nice, cool cave temperature. And oftentimes our basements emulate that. <coughs> if you go down in your basement right now, more than likely it is way cooler than that uh, because part of your basement is exposed to the outdoors. It's not a true cave, of course. But you get the idea. Another exception uh, are something called hot spots. A hot spot is when we have a, a pool of magma unusually close to the surface. And uh, oftentimes, well, well, you know those for like uh, Yellowstone is a great example of a hot spot. Right? It keeps all that water boiling and the geysers geysering and all that neat stuff over there. And sometimes the hot spots work their way all the way to the surface. And then we call them volcanoes. And that, by the way, is how we figured out rather early on that the Earth isn't solid all the way through, because it leaks quite frequently, right? Now, I'm sure back when we first started paying attention to this and writing about this and so on and so forth, I don't know that they cons considered the, you know, that it was all the way through the Earth, or maybe there was just, you know, this this pool of magma right here. I mean, hell, we used to think there was a, a blacksmithing god up at the top of that mountain doing stuff. You know, so, um, but at some point we came to the idea, all right, that, um, you know, the inside of the earth is, is molten, and it's certainly due to the fact that every so often we saw lava. All right. This image brings me right back to third grade. This is so like late 70s, early 80s colors. I love it. I remember kitchens that color and appliances. A wonderful time. And back then when you were in that grade, whatever decade it was, you learned crust, mantle, and core. Okay? Well, you're in college now. we got to kick it up a notch. <coughs> Not only are we going to use the words inner core and outer core, and everyone can giggle when you say inner core, but... Um, we're going to also, in a moment or two, add lithosphere and a stenosphere. All right? But for right now, let's just focus on crust, mantle, and two levels of core. The crust, we've, you know, already talked about a good bit. Um, you know it and love it. It's outside there. And uh, it's where we do all of our life on. It's that. Uh, a little more than the two miles that we've actually gone into of the Earth. It's broken, cracked, it's old, it's full of dirt and dust, but it's what we got. Beneath that is the mantle. And most of the time, me included, we use the word molten when we talk about the mantle. That is not 100% right on. All right, because when you think of molten, you think of that, that lava coming out of the surface, right? It's not like that at all. 
Um, we talked about the pressure with the diamond mining people, right? Um, that pressure has a huge effect on how materials behave. Uh, best example I could give you is um, uh, those little green propane tanks. They're a big white propane tank, but most of you have uh, the ability to uh, at least go play with one of these uh, targets or something if uh, Walmart's, if you don't know what I'm talking about. Has anyone ever shook a propane tank? It won't blow up. You can do that. All right, somebody tell me. If you take it, you go just shake, 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 shake. What do you hear? Ah, there is a little little BB in some of those. That's a spray paint can. The, the dingy. Yeah, it sloshes. It's liquid. All right. When you screw it onto a nozzle and turn on that nozzle, does liquid trickle out? Gas comes out. What the hell? Was that magic? No, it's pressure. All right. You pressurize a gas, it turns into a liquid. That's chem class stuff. Well, when you pressurize this liquidy stuff, <coughs> it doesn't exactly turn into a solid. It turns into something a lot more like Play-Doh, all right, or modeling clay. So when we say molten, that's really what we mean. It's not sloshing around like like you know water in there. All right, so that's the mantle. So that's why when it comes to the surface, it's all woo, happy and sloshing around and everything because it's out, it's free of that pressure for a change. All right, anyhow, outer core and inner core. The outer core is still uh, very similar to that. We're learning a lot about the, the core and even still the mantle uh, every day. <coughs> but suffice it to say, it's, it's fairly different from the mantle. Its composition is a little different. We're going to have slides on all this stuff. I'm, I'm kind of jumping ahead. I apologize. But um, we'll just gloss over the slides when we get there. Uh, it's got a good bit more metal in it, in the mantle, um, than the mantle. The core has more metal in it. Uh, anyhow, the outer core is um, we're going to call molten again. And this time you can picture something uh, like quicksilver, mercury, if you, if you can picture that. All right. Uh, or just some sort of molten metal that you may have seen in on TV. The inner core is solid metal. All right. Um, so we do have that, that solid jawbreaker in the center there. <coughs> and remember we told you the other day that that outer core sloshing around that inner core gives us um, our polarity, gives us our energy field, our force field, our magnetosphere protection. So that's very important and something, again, that we mentioned just the other day. So crust mantle, inner core, outer core, four more points on the test. Yeah? Um, why would people say that when you said inner core? Because it sounds like another word. Oh, oh I sound really inner core. Oh. All right, a little bit more about the crust. Like I said, we've got slides for each of these layers. So the crust is split into two kinds of crust, oceanic and continental. Oceanic and continental. Um, we still consider the ocean floor the surface of the Earth. It's, it's really, you know, people just don't ever kind of get on board with that, students, etc. cetera. All right. Um, you think of the surface of the earth, you think about where we're standing and doing everything that we do in life. But the ocean floor is still part of the surface of the earth. It just happens to be covered, you know, by a mile of ocean or whatever. <clears throat> so the ocean uh, crust is different than the continental crust. These words probably don't mean anything to you yet, uh, but they will soon. These are two types of igneous rocks that we'll study at some point. Whether you're in earth science or geology, you're going to hear these words. So oceanic crust is made out of something called basalt. It's a dark black rock, and it was at some point in time lava. The continent is made out of something called granite. 
Uh, granite was never lava. It was that other word. Remember, you heard the word magma before? All right. It's the same stuff. It's just when it's inside the earth, we call it magma. When it's outside the earth, we call it lava. I don't know why, but it is. Anywho, so the granite was actually made deep inside the earth, and it sort of got pushed upwards and became the continents. As you'll see on another slide, I don't think it's the next one. It might be a little later. Uh, these guys have slightly different densities, basalt and granite. And because of that, one floats a little higher than the other. And that's actually fairly important. It's a really small difference. You're going to see, you know, it's like 0.2 grams per centimeter or something, cubic centimeter difference. Um, not a huge amount, but it's enough that it gave us a little bit of original offset. The granites, that means the continents sat a little higher than what would become the ocean floor. We didn't have water at this point. Uh, this is way before water. So we had these rocks forming. <clears throat> and what that ha allowed then was for us to have from, from moment one practically, high spots and low spots. And the water eventually started accumulating on these lower spots, the ocean floor, the oceanic crust, what we'd call the oceanic crust. And uh, as more and more water accumulated there, it actually pushed it down a little bit, which buoyed the continents up even more. Okay? And we've got more of an offset than, than ever. So that, that's the reason the oceans are so much further down now, um, is, uh, of course, that they, they, they have the weight of the oceans on them. The ocean floor is much lower. Anywho, uh, on top of that, the, the crust itself is uh, much thinner under the oceans and uh, much thicker on top of land. Again, the obvious reasons, of course, we've got a lot of mountains. Uh, we've got Lord knows how many years of sedimentary rock built up, dust, dirt that I mentioned a little while ago. <coughs> so, two kinds of crust. The mantle. Now I mentioned Plato in modeling clay a couple minutes ago. That's because I couldn't remember the word silly putty. They use any kind of word to get you to get the idea of the texture. All right, but there's something unique about silly putty that, that Plato doesn't do, that that modeling clay doesn't do. And lately, more and more, they've been trying to get folks to to say silly putty instead of, of, of uh, clay. Silly putty has a property of elasticity. You can stretch it, it bounces, if you recall. And the more we study it, they're starting to feel that there's this elastic nature to um, the material in the mantle. I'm not sure what effect, if any, it has on things. But again, I'm just you know, relating the information as I as I understand it to you. Uh, the mantle is not consistent. It too is layered. And if this were a different kind of class, well, we would go into that a whole lot more. But I do want you to know that there are layers to the mantle. One of them, the upper mantle, is important for plate tectonics. Decor. So I told you earlier it was, it was metal. Well, it's mostly iron and some nickel. And I'm sure a few other things thrown in. At some point, we're going to talk about the earth coming together, and I'm going to talk about density separation. Density separation uh, is exactly why you have to shake the uh, bottle of orange juice before you pour yourself a glass. All right? All that good stuff, the pulp and whatever, settles down to the bottom. And if you happen to look at that jar of orange juice, in fact, I ask you to look at the jar of orange juice next time before you pull it out of the fridge, <coughs> you're going to see different levels of orangeness or yellowness or whatever. That happens in the earth. It happened in the earth. Past tense. Um, the heavier stuff settled out. All right, We were a molten ball of goo at one point. And uh, as the outside started cooling off, 
okay? Uh, the heavier stuff settled out. Well, in a sphere, settling out means going to the center. So all our heaviest stuff, in this case, the irons and the nickels and whatnot, congregated in the center. Now, we talked about the importance of pressure. Again, not my end of geology here. <clears throat> I can't begin to explain, you know, why the pressure treats metals differently than it treats the silica-rich stuff in the mantle, and why all of a sudden, uh, when we switch from the outer core to the inner core, it just stops being molten and turns into a solid. I, I don't have the bandwidth for that one. Okay, above my pay grade, as they say. But the folks in charge of this did their research, continue to do their research, and they still feel that this is the case. So we're going to trust them in this way. There is a good bit deal of trust in science that the folks in charge know what the hell they're actually doing. Quite often not the case. Or they think they know what they're doing, but somebody finds out something new. Right? Again, scientific method. Ideally, not just ignorance. Okay, I mentioned there were two more words coming beyond crust, mantle, core, core. Lithosphere and asthenosphere. Astheno. We don't really have that consonant cluster too many other places in the English language. Um, there's a mineral in lab called sphalerite, which comes close to being as weird as this word. But uh, astheno is how you pronounce that. Anywho, uh, the lithosphere is uh, where you live. It's the crust and just a wee bit of the mantle. Um, picture the last time you cracked open an egg. And you know how there's that little bit of goo that you can never quite get off the inside of the egg shell. That's about how much mantle is attached to the lithosphere. And then the asthenosphere is the part of the mantle that's just below that, uh, what we could arguably call the middle mantle. Uh, and they feel it's important that you know that, of course, it is not all of the rest of the mantle. So I, I did tell you that the, the mantle was divided into layers, and we had the upper, middle, and lower show up on a previous slide. Well, we're dealing now with subdivisions of that even. You just need to worry about the lithosphere and the stenosphere. So, to keep with the same wonderful color scheme, and, oh, I don't know, maybe showing you uh, six more points on the next test, um, let's uh, go through this real quick. The uh, right side of this diagram refers to the sort of grade school version where we have crust mantle and core, core. And then the left side uh, adds the lithosphere and asthenosphere vocabulary words, right? So you tell me, uh, crust, what letter? D, awesome. Uh, inner core? E, beautiful. Mantle? C, great. And outer court. A, B. So, I'm sort of really happy we're leaving Scantrons behind. I'm not a fan of uh, online testing by any means, but Scantrons, uh, and you guys had, you know, 12 years of being yelled at about Scantrons. Um, I personally sometimes need more than A, B, C, D, E. I sometimes need more than five answers in a multiple choice question. So I had this crazy idea years ago, because uh, I, I never set my tests off to get graded. First of all, there's that whole pencil pen thing and you guys scratching stuff out and changing your mind 63 times and all that. I've always just hand graded my, my tests, you know, even the scan trucks. So I needed more than five answers. So I did something crazy. I like, I made AB as an answer. And AC is an answer, because I didn't have F and G. But you guys, oh my God, are you allowed to color in two dots in a row? No! Right? That, that freaks out the computer. Well, luckily I'm not a computer. Anyhow, that's why there's an AB there. And even though I, I give this same speech every semester, when I give this first test, 
someone would come up and be like, what do I do with AB? Well, you color in A and B. Well, we, we can't, I, 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 and you can just see his brain just starting to smoke. Um, anyhow, AB. And then the folks online who are looking at a, a digital test anyhow, they're like, well, why, why doesn't he just call it F? Well, I'm too lazy to relabel my diagrams. That's why I don't call it F. But um, at any rate, hence the AB. And yes, uh, to this day, you might even still see, because I, I probably, when I digitized everything, I probably kept the same answers there. So you might even see an AC one of these days. Um, anywho. So crust mantle core core. Let's jump over to the other side. We've got lithosphere and aesthetosphere. Uh, which one is which letter? A is lithosphere, B then is the aesthetosphere, and we're trying to give you, again, some concept uh, that it's not all of the mantle, just some of the mantle. The aesthetosphere is important because at the moment they feel that's where these, uh, these currents, these heat cells are that, um, that run plate tectonics exist. Um, when I was in college, they kind of thought that it was a series, kind of like uh, cogs in a and a clockwork or in a mill. Uh, big ones on the bottom, smaller and smaller as you go up. Um, and that actually still makes a whole lot of sense to me. But um, nowadays they just talk about uh, currents uh, in the convection cells, convection currents in the asthenosphere. Ha, <laughs> speaking of which, plate tectonics. So you've heard of plate tectonics, I hope. Uh, when I was in high school, which wasn't that horribly long ago, um, a lot of teachers still use the word uh, continental drift. It's come to my attention that you guys still know the words continental drift. Um, hopefully, it's in the context of, we used to call it continental drift, now we call it plate tectonics, but, you know, it is what it is. Um, continental drift is a pretty old idea. It was right on. Um, talk about being able to make inferences, okay, and then have them later supported by data. Unfortunately, this guy was not around to see his uh, ideas get proven, unfortunately. Um, but it matured over the years into this idea called plate tectonics. <clears throat> I'll give you a quick summary in case you remember. Uh, the guy everyone heard about was uh, Alfred uh, Wegener, Al Wegener, all right? And he uh, looked at some maps, he did this, he did that. And he was the guy that said that uh, South America and Africa looked like they fit together uh, like pieces of a kid's puzzle. And, uh, you know, they really do. And more so, if you start rearranging uh, all the cotton, the rest of the cotton, it's just a little bit, uh, you can get them to squeeze in right together as well. He even went and got some data such as he could. Uh, when you put South America and Africa back together, some mountain chains line up. All right? Something that's in the northern part of Africa uh, meshes up with something that's in the southern part of South America, vice versa. I think which way it goes. Might be southern Africa, northern uh, South America. Anyhow, mountain chains lined up. <clears throat> in other parts, the rock layers lined up. Fossils lined up, which meant same environments. Critters live in certain environments. Plants grow in certain environments. So when you put all this back together, he's like, guys, look at this. Well, when he presented this paper, unfortunately, he had the uh, bad luck to uh, present it to a conference of geophysicists who are a bunch of pains in the butt. I still say that to this day. I'll go on record. Geophysicists, no, they're all right. They're all right. But still, they're, they're math people. All right, when it gets right down to it. And I don't have an engineering brain. A lot of geologists don't have an engineering brain. Um, but physicists, they do. And it's a good thing because, you know, engineering is very important, but it's for the select few. Anywho, he presented his paper to them that the continents had been moving. And they're like, yeah, right, Al. How's that work? Well, I don't know, but look at this data. It, it all it all goes together. Like, yeah, okay, come back when you can tell us how it works. 
What do you think? The continents are floating through the oceans? I'm weaving a story here, but you get the idea. Okay. Um, he didn't know. But he was pretty damn sure it, was, it happened. So over the years, we've figured that out. We've explored the ocean floor. We've seen these giant seams in the ocean floor, these plate boundaries. We see where new crust is being made. We see where old crust is being destroyed. And <clears throat> hell, nowadays we've got satellites up in the sky tracking these continents. We can tell you which continent is moving in what direction and how fast it's moving. We know that North America is moving to the northwest. We know that I forget which direction Eurasia is moving, but they're moving farther apart. So the airlines don't give this, them this information because every year North America and Europe get a little farther apart. All right, and they're charging for that, I'm sure. And they think they know how it works now. I don't want to say science is a bit more forgiving than it used to be, but you know, believe in plate tectonics. It is. All right. And um, there's a whole lot of things in science that people are like, yeah. No, plate tectonics is not one of those to be argued with. You want to go figure out better how it works, guy? You know, great. Please do so. Um, Perfect example. I just told you North America is moving northwest. All right, Pacific Ocean moving in a slightly different direction. Why? Well, the currents underneath it are spinning in a different method and in a different direction and a different speed. Okay, that's why, but how come? Well, um, and then you're going to get a story. So, North American plate goes from the middle of the Atlantic Ocean to the west coast of North America. All right? Starts in the middle of the Atlantic, goes all the way over to the west coast. As you may or may not be aware, California's got a big old seam down the center of it. Southern half of California is attached to the Pacific Ocean plate. Again, the majority of the ocean is on one hunk of rock. They could tell you long before we had satellites up there, and whether or not they'd heard of Al Wegner or not, they could tell you a long time ago that at that scene, something really weird was happening. And the Earth was trying to move itself in two different directions. We know what's happening. But we don't know why. But we see all this evidence so they don't argue about the, yeah, I don't know if that's a thing anymore, which is good. Al Wagner died in a polar expedition, I believe it was. He was looking for more evidence to support his cause, one of those things that got lost in a whiteout. And uh, I think that was his ending story. Um, there were some other folks, Edwin Seuss, not the good doctor that you guys know and love, but a different Seuss. Uh, he was also working on this, and we're a handful of other people. Uh, it's hardly ever just one person, but oftentimes one person gets remembered for it. So, uh, Just a wee bit more of plate tech, and then we're going to call it a day. You guys have been awesome. I can see you slowly but surely glazing over. So, uh, and I've been talking for a little over an hour, which is no wonder my throat is <clears throat> kind of raw. So, um, the crust. You've always heard the crust is broken in the plates. Again, we're in college now. We're going to say that the lithosphere, because it's not just the crust, it's that little bit of mantle goo on the bottom. That's important. All right. Uh, and those are the plates in the plate tectonics. Uh, the lithosphere that's broken up rests on the asthenosphere. And the uh, areas uh, where one plate ends and another one starts, that, that break, that crack, okay, we call that a plate boundary. And when we get to this chapter, we're going to tell you that um, there's only so many ways that these things are currently moving or interacting. We're going to give you names for all those, but it has its own chapter. So we're going to save that for then. Um, picture... Ice on a pond that. that is uh, has cracked and starting to break up, okay? And you've got these different sheets of ice that are 
more or less, you know, bumping up against one another. Um, but believe it or not, they still have room to move around, and, and that's because not that they necessarily have any elbow room, uh, but because at some points those um, pieces of ice are being destroyed, which creates room that allows the other ones to shift into. Um, the difference here, of course, with the lift is that we also have <clears throat> more rock being created, more ice being created. Here's a map real quick. Um, there's basically seven large plates that we recognize, more or less more or less equivalent to the continents and uh, or the ocean. There's many, many smaller ones. My favorite smaller one is the Juan de Fuca. I just like saying Juan de Fuca. Um, but that's over there along the Pacific plate. And when it comes time, we will show you that um, if you happen to stare at those boundaries long enough and connect them to some historical and or current events, uh, you'll notice that those are where the majority of the world's earthquakes and volcanoes and mountain ranges exist. And over time, um, that's really started a, ch a change sort of in the philosophy or the way we teach geology uh, when I was in school, plate tectonics was the last chapter in the book. And if you got to it, you got to it. Nowadays, it's like chapter two or three in your textbook. Okay. Um, and uh, God forbid they, they interrupt minerals still being first, but uh, it's, it's right there. And your book might have actually, your, the author may have made the bold move of putting plate tech before minerals. But um, it just sort of changes how they've, they've felt about plate tectonics over the years. I try to represent both sides of that. I am, by all means, old school. Don't get me wrong. Um, I give you this talk. We've spent 15 minutes on it, okay? And uh, that way, if we don't, for whatever reason, get to plate tectonics uh, at, by the end of the semester, we've still talked about it. I've still explained and highlighted its importance, okay? And uh, if we get to go into greater detail, then, then awesome. But it is important. It's responsible for the majority of the things we're going to talk about this semester. So, All right. That is the end of this section of the PowerPoint. I think we've got roughly one more class period on this PowerPoint. It's a long one, I know. Um, and actually, it's a lot longer then we're going to go into it. And sometimes um, I go all the way back to the uh, creation of the universe and up to the basically the habitation of the Earth. Um, we're going to skip that this semester because I did it last semester, and it really made a difference in what we were able to cover. Um, so as in not a lot because I talked about that. So we're going to probably skip the cosmology, which in some ways is... Uh, like I said, arguably connected to this conversation, but not this semester. So we'll do one more lecture on this, be done with it, and then we'll move on to, to minerals.